uh, we met when I was young in faith, and uh, the Lord has helped us in our journey. We are 39 years in marriage. Um, and, and the Lord has been faithful to us many times uh, when I'm congratulating people in Facebook, my friends in Facebook. I tell them, look at the rear lights behind and follow. You'll be safe as you look at us from behind. Uh, keep coming. And so even tonight, as you hear the little things that we may share, they're just a glimpse of the journey God has taken us through. And for sure, one verse which we took uh, when we were getting married, we didn't know. It's Psalm 48, verse 14. Uh, and it says, this God will be my God, he will be my guide to the very end. And he has continued to be our God, he has continued to be our guide. Because many times in marriage you don't have a book to follow, but God is there and he has guided us. And I pray that he will do the same in your marriage. The Lord bless you. Thank you very much. We praise God to be here. And we want to start by I want to start by appreciating the senior pastor and the leadership of this church that has given us this opportunity to be with you tonight. And if God wills us tomorrow morning. I'm also glad to come to quite a number of people that we have met before. I was the first that we could in this life. I've met somebody else that I was their pastor in Sit and Karen. So I am not among strangers, I'm among friends, and I'm glad to be here and uh, to answer your questions. Uh, yes, we've been married for 39 years. Perhaps that's to say that marriage works. It is possible to be married and be married and be blessed of God, and uh, it becomes a blessing to the people that move to God. But also, it is also to say that we don't have all the answers. Uh, we, we, we don't have all the answers. Um, we are trying, we are learning. Uh, we have learned a few things and we will share a few things. And uh, in the interest of time, I will just get, back, uh, get to that. Uh, and then we will try to answer some of the questions that we may put book or that you already have. I was asked to come and speak on accountability in marriage. I don't think I need to define what marriage is, but uh, maybe we can talk about accountability. And when I thought of accountability, I just googled. Uh, Dr. Google gives answers to many questions. And Google said, Accountability, and I'm quoting, is the acceptance of responsibility for one's own actions. Accountability is acceptance of responsibility for one's own actions. You are accountable for your actions. And today I was asked to speak about spirituality. Doctor, I was to speak about our physical accountability and being accountable when it comes to money. But it goes on, goes on to say, it implies, if that is the definition, it implies a willingness to be transparent, allowing others to observe and evaluate one's performance. And right there, we start eating a snack. Because when we are asked to be transparent, you know what is transparent? These windows are transparent. You can see through. It means that in marriage, we are allowing our spouse to see through what could be opaque. I think Kenyans are now familiar with that, that term. It's the opposite of opaque. Opaque is that what we can't see through it. But transparent is the glass. Because we can see through it. And that is, I'm saying, that's where many of us have a challenge. So, in theory, many people will agree that it is important for us to be accountable, especially when it relates to other people. 
when we are saying the government should be accountable, when we are saying your spouse should be accountable, but it becomes a problem when you, the speaker, you are asked to be accountable. I want my wife to be accountable, but I don't want to be accountable myself to her. That's what I mean. Uh, but may the Lord help us that uh, we can be accountable. We can be transparent. We can take responsibility for the things that we do, for the words that we speak, and for the things that we are entrusted with or we are stewards of. So I thought, let me start by saying, what are the hindrances to accountability? And the first one that I thought of is what I will call ungodly worldview. Ungodly worldview. And this is influenced by our cultures. And yet the worldviews are foundational. The influence that we receive from culture, the influence that we receive from our friends, the ones that we associate with closely, they influence who we are and what we are. We allow, you know, what has been spoken to our lives rather than the Bible, because I say that godly. We all have a world, a world view. But our worldview can be influenced by the scriptures, but it can also be influenced by culture. For example, men are told you have no business answering anything to a woman. And when it says a woman, it includes your wife. And when you take that to marriage, it becomes a hindrance in accountability in all areas except the ones that you choose to be accountable in. So we need to examine, we need to examine who has influenced us. Which worldview are we following? Are we scriptural? Because, and I read from the King James Version of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, where the Bible talks about, first talks about marriage, verse 24, the conclusion of the matter is this, therefore, Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and shall be one flesh? Three words there. Leave, cleave, and weave. Those words are used by a man called Walter Trovish in a book that he calls I Married You. You can Google it. I think it's downloadable, free of charge. I married you by daughter Trovish. Now, three words that are there. Leave, cleave. Now, in modern English, cleave means to separate or split along a fort. But in old English, and that's why if you read the other versions, it says a man shall leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and become one flesh. But I like this because of the way it sounds. Leave, weave, cleave. Or leave, cleave, weave. By weaving, I mean, I mean when you weave something, it comes together. It is brought together. It is brought together. So, my brothers and sisters, if truly we are going to obey this verse, because that is the principle that God has laid down for marriage, it means that we must, let me start with the word leave. You must leave everything that you may know that is contrary to what the scriptures say. And that is difficult. Leaving the father and mother sometimes may actually mean leaving their values, living their cultural norms, what they have placed as most important in life. You may have to say, yes, I was born in this particular cultural uh, inclination, but I must leave it. I need to change it and start defining a new one, hopefully that is biblical and that is in line with the word of God. And I'm 
coming back to the word of God because we are a church, we are Christians, we believe in God and he has a way as to how marriage should be done. Yes, we evaluate. We don't necessarily throw out, but we evaluate what is off on offer and we take what is good and we leave what is not good. God created a man and a woman to be equal. The world may define it differently. But the same God has said, there is the head who is the man. The world now is telling us, no, we are equal in every way. We are not equal in every way. God who initiated this, and it is his idea that men should get married, he said, the man is the head. So even as you account, we need to follow the ways of God. Then it says that we, we be united. And this is where accountability helps us. When we are accountable, there is a greater chance of us being truly united. You know, you can have a marriage where people leave their appearances. When they come to church, they may come together. But as soon as they go home, they have, they have nothing in common. Why did I say go home? As soon as they leave the church and enter the car, the wife looks that way, and the man looks this way. Because they are not united. They are not going in the same direction. I counsel young people when they are getting married. And I tell them, when you start in marriage, it is important for you to go together, to walk together. If you can know what I mean, parallel, be parallel to each other. Because if there is even a slight deviation, we understand that term? Jessica, can you come here, please? So that we illustrate. <laughs> when you walk together like this, <laughs> when you walk like this, together like this, even if you walk for 39 years, you will still be together. Are we together? If there is a slight deviation, that also a slight deviation, it may not be noticed at this point. But if we both started walking and walking, and imagine this walk is a number of years, this is now. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you can stop there. By this time, you are far apart. And when you are far apart, you cannot, when we were there, we can talk easily with one another. But at this point, you start shouting at each other. And the shouting may not necessarily be, where? No, it may be, you are speaking, and the other person can't hear what you're saying, can't understand you, can't follow you. This is the point that some people get into. You know, by this time, that's when, if you used to live in a village, your wife leaves you and goes to see a child that has been born in Nairobi. And Okay? In these days, they don't go to Nairobi because Nairobi is where people are on earth that are elderly. What happens these days, my sister? After many years, you hear the wife has gone to America. Because the children now went to America, Australia, Dubai, and wherever. And when they go there now, they don't go for a month. They go for six months. <laughs> or three years. I have shortened it. You have had it from one of them. <laughs> and you are wondering what happened. Because these people appeared to be together. But why is it? It is because as time went by, there was that deviation. And I am saying this cognizant of the fact that there are people here who have been married for a much shorter time. They are in that danger. But when you are not gone too far, you can still now turn towards each other. 
and I'm hoping that I will help a couple or two who may have gone in that direction. Lead, cleave, and then we join together. It is like twisted yards. Two threads that are twisted around one. And the, the same one is God. Because the marriage is an institution that was started by God. And God needs to be present. Let me digress in all. There are different stages in marriage. When people get married, at the beginning, it is called the dream stage. Oh, I was looking forward to getting married. After the dream, you know, when you know when the man got home, I told him to have a cup of tea. I saw that I told him to have a cup of and the wife comes picking them, putting them in the right place. Or is it the man? No, these days you can't control who is speaking. But anyway, you understand what I am saying. After that dream, he gets to a place where a person says, Hey, I think I was changed in this union. So it becomes drama. Okay? This is after about five, seven years, nine, ten. That's when they start questioning each other. If you don't correct things, and I'm saying where things go wrong, after you have finished the drama, you go to a dynamic situation, and I'm saying dynamic in the sense, that's where you find Kilamutu and Ajitipanga. So one goes east, one goes west, they meet in the evening, they sleep, they wake up, you know, at that point, they, you know, we are just there to keep their appearances. And the final analysis that I was I described it, that's where the man will be left. And you know why the men are left? Because they are told our son has got a daughter or a child, and they're in America, and who conveys are very expensive in a family. What a year they can say. At the end of the work, as well, my child will go. <laughs> okay? But it's not just that. It's also in many other things. If only one man or one person in the marriage is progressing, let's start here. You started, maybe you got married when you left high school. But one of you goes ahead, does the first degree, does the second degree, does the third degree. You know, after some time, you will look at the spouse that did do the degrees, and you are more exposed. You speak even better English, maybe you speak like an American. <laughs> and the other person is saying, Abaya, I, I, no, I speak in English, and uh, meets you with the with mother tongue, eh, mother tongue, eh, eh, how are you? You start getting embarrassed because when you have you advanced, see you, you have met with people at that level, you bring them to a dinner like this, you come with your wife, you are discussing certain issues, and your wife can only say, you know, Jeb, eh? Jeb, then you hold like this, and you are discussing mother Am I communicating? Yes. So it may not be gender, it may be the level of exposure. That deviation will bring a problem. But when there is accountability, it is where you say, yes, we may not have enough money for both of us to go to school at the same time. But now that I have studied and I have gotten my first degree and my second degree, let us now also help you to get your first degree. Because there is a counterbalance, and maybe I'm jumping the gun. I didn't finish my, my deeds. I said dream, drama, the dynamic uh, issues. But the last one, when people have walked well, it is a dance. Have you seen people dancing? I know you may not dance much because you are Christians, 
but he's like, these dances were people hold each other. You don't step exactly at the same place. See you? But there is a harmony about it. When you have walked well towards those years of faith, then, you will see a couple that is still united, that is dancing together. They are not duplicates of each other, but they are actually, you know, there is a harmony about their life. Well, that's if you will. We were talking about the hindrances and godly worldview that influences to go in that direction. I think the second thing I would say is this. Uh, foundational issues. How did we start? If we started wrong, if we moved in without proper you know, discussion about our marriage, we are likely to mistrust each other. If you if we got married because one of us got pregnant, and, you know, and we did not resolve that, it could happen, but you can still go back to God, repent, ask God for forgiveness, restore yourself. But if that is not resolved, mistrust remains. And every time you will be seen smiling to another man or smiling to another woman or receiving a gift. Let me, let me give an example. Last night as uh, the pastors or the people that work at the head office we had a dinner. And one of the things that was recounted was this. That uh, you know this, you have secret friends. How you pick papers and at the end of the year you give gifts. So somebody said, this is very dangerous. Because if I pick a, a paper of, uh, say for example for me, I pick up a paper of a woman and uh, there is mistrust at home uh, and she gives me a gift and I go home and tell my wife that I took this gift from so and so. And she has always had a mistrust she will start suspecting. She may not even say. But you know what you suspect also influences your decision, your behavior. It does. And that's what I mean that we need to resolve the things. If we fail, we need to solve those things so that there is trust. Because I, in all that I will say, please don't forget this. Accountability builds trust. Without trust, no marriage can stand. Trust is so important. Trust, I repeat, is invaluable when it comes to marriage. So, anything that will break trust. The other difference would be just pride. What somebody will call superiority complex. And if this, this pride is not necessarily saying that I am proud. You know, we judge each other from our points of strength. I am very good at directions. Me. On the other hand, my wife, you could have come from this way, and she will say we came from this way. <laughs> so sometimes I'm tempted, because I'm a human being. <laughs> <laughs> and the other day, when I was canceling, I canceling a couple who are going to be getting married early next year. He told on me that we actually judge each other from the point of strength. If you are strong in numbers, okay, if you are strong in maths, and you know maths means also money. If you are strong in management of money, and the other one is not then you start judging that one from your strength. Are we together? Yes. And you start saying, you can't get what happens. You be in business, and one of you is strong in that, and the other one is not. There will be a problem. But the truth of the matter is this. Many times we are not the same. But that's why we tell one another when we get married. That it is about complementing each other 
not about competing with each other. Some of us cannot, men are saying that they cannot multitask. But the women can multitask. They can be cooking, listening to a baby who is upstairs, and the other children who are outside who are playing, she can hear you know when there is trouble. But a man, when he's reading the newspaper, he can't even hear when you are sitting here telling him, hey, can you pass that sort? <laughs> we need to learn to complement each other because that helps us in becoming accountable to one another. And the understanding of your spouse, knowing the strength, knowing the weakness. When you know your strength, know that that is like a coin. A coin has two sides. Know what is head and what is dead. It means if the head is strong, that inside of it is a place where you are likely to judge your person. And that judgment is out of pride. I am telling you, and I have become vulnerable. I have told you because sometimes we are talking with my wife and she's telling she's telling me, Sina Nairobi <laughs> And this Nairobi, listen, you know that is inconsequential. <laughs> Martin, my brother, let me tell you, they are asking me, listen. Sometimes we are going to visit some place and she's the one who was there. So she's supposed to give me directions. <laughs> so she tells me, I'm not sure we turn here. Oh, oh, no, 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 I think we should turn there. Oh, no. You get me. <laughs> so I have to ensure. <laughs> but I have no, and I have accepted. And I have said I will compliment. And I said, you may. Let me tell you this kind of something, other example. You know, I am the person who spends money. I see something nice, I want to buy it. My wife, on the other hand, is the kind that wants us to save. I tell her, Sasa, to me answer to buy the flowers, the grapes, some of the food. That's the piece of the <laughs> So we are saving. Other people come to enjoy the city. Can we please go to Masai Mara? Let the monkey see us. Let them know what they see. They see only what's good to see. And that way, we complement each other. You know, and they seem to be complaining and uh, talking badly about my wife. The truth is this. Were it not for my wife, most likely we would not be having the house we have. But she insisted we must save so that we have a deposit to buy a house. And when we bought the house, she told me, No, any extra money we get, please let's pay for this house to reduce. So instead of paying the mortgage for 18 years, we paid it exactly in nine years. To the man. So you see, she compliments me. But I also compliment her so that from time to time she can come to Eldoret. I own it. It is not just in Nairobi. Like in a simple mutu abaya at the day and a fikiria. In Mabaya can I do a kikupika. And you know where we come from, both of us, unfortunately. We are very poor in cooking. Generally, where we come from, we put potatoes, beans, raw beans, beans. So it is good to travel. I am also complimented as you And I'm saying, go and start doing these things. I think I'm going off the top. <laughs> the other reason why we may not, you know, agree to be vulnerable and to allow ourselves to be uh, to be accountable is when there is fear of being judged much. Especially when you have failed. I don't want to be accountable. I've made many plans. You heard that it is me who likes spending money. Brought in a house I am there. And we have lost money. You know? 
and I have had to be accountable. That is what you said to be accountable. And I am talking about lots of money because you bought without due diligence and we have suffered. But we have learned also in the process of that. But also, when there is fear of being judged, of being judged there is possibility of manipulating each other. But we need to be aware of that. Uh, when there is this kind of judgment, there is lack of agreement. And you see, God has promised blessing where two people live together in unity. In the book of Psalms 133, it says, How good and pleasant it is for brothers, I would say even for married couples, to dwell together in unity. Because when that happens, the Lord blesses, he commands, verse 3 says, he commands his blessing there. The, 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 the opposite, or the vice versa, or the, I'm lost, losing the word that I should use, but the opposite of that is that you can open the door. Where there is no unity, you can open the door for the enemy. An answer to no one name the you know what is happening. And when you hear that voice, it is not the spirit of God. Some people say, I'm telling you about it. If you hear something say, you know, that is not God. That is the devil. He is the accuser of the brethren and he's the one that wants to bring division where things should happen. Obviously, selfishness is another thing. When I want to be selfish or greedy, or a miser, or to be mean, I will not be accountable. So I will go and take a loan of a million shillings, and I will come and say, let you work loan, which will be paid 500,000. You see, you, you are accountable partially. There's 500, so the wife knows we are paying a loan off, so salary kikita akita utue itakwe imekatwa. But because you are mean, you're selfish, you want to hide the other money, I don't know for what, you say for a rainy day or for yourself, while well, others are not. That is what happens today. In days gone by, those people that were mean, were says like me, they would go. And I saw this, you know, this, this, this is years also. So, let me tell you stories of what was used to do. That I know. I used to go to a shopping center. I didn't go in a town where I grew in the village. So, the Mzee would go to town and he to the shopping center. They have such shops few, just a few. And there they would drink. In the midst of drinking, an Ajoma half a kilo. And I put a young man. You know, as I'm acting like this, I am somebody in my mind. Because it's me, he doesn't want to be accountable. And he doesn't want to say what happened. Actually, my grandfather was like that. The one I am named after, but I refuse, I refuse to be like that. To be like him. So he would come and would run away, or people would run away. But he, he has eaten. So even as he is pouring that mixture that was going to be mashed, it's because his stomach is okay. So may the Lord help us so that we will break those things that will cause us to be abusers of one another and refuse to be accountable. Of course, when, when trust has been broken once, uh, and trust can be broken by many things, I don't know whether I should give this example, but because you don't know, let me just give it. I once was translating a couple, mm -hmm. they were doing very well. I mean, they are high in society. Uh, let me not mention the kind of job they were doing, but 
the you there people that you expected to be out there. What made you learn that their main problem was that the man was grandpa was gambling, not grumbling, was gambling. So he would he had even borrowed from people and he kept thinking there is one day I am going to win the money that I have lost. And because of that, he could not pay school fees, he could not pay for the house. The wife had been struggling, she was also in a, a relatively good job. But by the point they were coming for counseling to me as a pastor, it is because the wife was feeling I am fed up. Uh, and actually was unable now at that point to continue paying fees and uh, paying for the house rent. These are people that should have owned their own house, but they couldn't. Why? Because the man had allowed himself to be taken by gambling. And I know that gambling these days can be 10 shillings, 100 shillings. I'm talking of a man who would gamble more than 100,000 because he would go to the casinos. The, the, this year mobile like where you think I you are and he would spend that. And they are expected to keep certain appearances. The car now has broken down, can't be repaired. The trust was broken. <coughs> and with the trust broken, it became very difficult. And the wife now started thinking, or oh, had started thinking, why should I also be accountable for what I am earning? May the Lord help us. So, three areas that I was asked to also mention. I am about to finish, Pastor. Spirituality. And I want to say spirituality is foundational for marriage. I think I already mentioned that. That we weave ourselves, my wife and I should weave ourselves around the center of God. Not what she will It is the center beyond, uh, 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 around which everything can stand. And when that center is not there, everything comes crumbling down. So it's foundational. It's the basis on which families can be built. And we need to be accountable about our spirituality, about our family devotion. Are we consistently taking the word of God? Are we consistently, as a family, praying together? What is happening in our family all the time? And we say that the man is the head. So you are the one that you should be asked. And I know many times we, we delegate that to the wife, but to our wives, or to us, yeah, to our wives, to do it. And wife, I will say this, if the man doesn't take that responsibility, don't just say it, because he's not taking, let every, you know, let every chip fall where it falls. Do what you can to salvage. When I say women, I know that the man should take the leadership in this area, but I want to say, please engage your children. They will see it, they will grow in it, and they will learn. Allow me to say something here, which is, is it to brag? On the day I was ordained, we had a celebration in the evening. And I, my children were there. Uh, I have three children for those who don't know, all of them now married, so I'm on But uh, my little one is a daughter, I have two boys and a girl. And I remember the words of my, my daughter. Uh, that's quite a while back, they were not married then. But uh, the preacher who had preached in Maribod on my ordination had talked about from the book of uh, uh, Jude had referred to what is called shooting stars. You know, those people who shine bright and go down. And my daughter at the party said, I know my father is not a passing cloud and is not a shooting star. She may not even remember she said that. But that 
has been one of my greatest affirmations for my children. To hear that, it also told me that my children were observing me. They are observing me. They are looking at me. Whatever you do. And I want to tell you, it starts early. Much, much earlier when my first born was about, had he gone to school? No, he had not gone to school. And I hope I will not appear to be Let me see you say it. <laughs> <laughs> I had this habit when I, I used to work in the government, I was not a pastor then. But I had this habit of every day when I got home, the first thing I would do, and I wish I was doing that even today, but the first thing that I would do was to go, there was a place I would kneel and just thank God and pray. And uh, my son had not even learned how to speak. One day he saw me walking home, getting to the house. He ran to the place where I used to be. And so when I went, I found him kneeling there and saying, What he hears his father saying, he goes and doesn't know. <laughs> and what I am saying is this, brothers and sisters. You may think I will do this when I am. I will set the example for my children when I am a bit. You know, or when they are older, I will tell them, they see you now. They watch you. What is it that you do? Because this was a child that had not yet gone to school, and not gone yet, uh, gone to nursery, uh, was learning to speak. And I want to say, you are supposed to be accountable for the spirituality of your family. It is not the pastor. As a pastor, we come, we will teach you the word of God, we will give you as much as we can, but you are the priest in your home. And here I'm talking to the men and telling them, take charge. Organize yourself. We have done different things over the years. There was a time we used to use a book uh, because of my background, where I came from. I came from working with students ministry. I had learned about something called Operation World. And there was a book that had all the countries of the world. And what we had done at that particular time is that we would pray for all the nations. We had divided them to seven. But, you know, Africa was alone, Europe was alone, Americas, you know, Asia, the Oceanias. I can't quite remember. I think Middle East, we had carved it alone. And every day there was one of those parts of the world that we used to pray for. <coughs> do we still do that? Sorry, I have what's needed. <laughs> but I am telling you things that you can do. There was a time uh, when we decided not too long we will be praying for different days. A day for praying for family, our family. Now that I have told you, uh, I have three children who are married, so we pray for them, their grandchildren, and pray for us. There was a day for the extended family. There was a day that we would pray for our friends, close friends, you know, people like your surviving groups or NCCG, things like that. And I'm saying, all those things have influenced my children. And I thank God that all my children have become believers in the Lord. I pray that they will continue holding on to that. Spiritual accountability. Doing things so that you are helping your children and you are helping yourself and helping your spouse. And I want to encourage somebody here to go and do that. There are seasons and you need to be true to those seasons when that may not be possible ever. So that some of you, what you need to do is that there is going to be this day or these days when we will have, in a week, when we will have <coughs> family devotions together. Maybe you normally do it alone. Maybe you do it alone. But there's this time when we will do it. 
and maybe read a Bible passage, a chapter by tonight or or that time, and you discuss it. Of course, if you can do it every day, the better. But if you can only afford to do it once a week, better something than nothing. But I would encourage, if it were possible, to do it every day. That way, it brings you together. Remember where we started? You live, you grieve, you weep. And that is what, when you are together, it is easier to be accountable, to take responsibility or to accept responsibility for your actions as we define it. If I may, I may leave that. I was asked also to mention about accountability physically. I just wanted to add in the area of accountability spiritually. One very important thing is the issue of accounting your spirituality to each other. Because nobody knows each person, right? For you, it's Bishop. He knows everything. He lives in heaven and comes back here to be with you. But I know him more than that. I know him in his times of weakness. <laughs> so I know him in his times of weakness and in his times of strength. And therefore, because we are comfortable to each other, his low moments, I'm able also to encourage him, I'm able to pray with him. And you know your person. And that is why God has put us together, that two are better than one. So even spiritually, two are better than one. So if you see your spouse going down spiritually, and you're not helping them to come up, then it is making sure that both of you are going down. And, and I normally say, uh, in marriage, one of the things we need to think about is that I want to see my spouse in heaven. So what do you do to make sure that your spouse goes to heaven? God bless you. Thank you. I learned from heaven to come and do this trip. I said, wow, don't be deceived. I know this guy. But it is true. It's very true. But we going on to the physical. I would say here, your presence. Availability for companionship without suffocating or over-controlling each other. You know, we want your valuable time. Your spouse wants it, desires to be with you, but there are people whose presence is hated, is roughed. That's, that's to say, some people, when they are present, they are, if you are a man, you want to control even the salt that goes to the kitchen. Now, they will start hating your presence. But if you are available for good conversations to join, you are going to write a letter to one another. I started by writing to my wife. Do you, can I tell you the first sentence? <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I thought it was a joke, so I was writing as a joke, but I said, later I change. Later, later I change. But the first sentence was, there was a, a way that the letter seems to be written, and so I copied that. So I told her, first and foremost, <laughs> receive greetings, as many as the sun of the sea, or the leaves of the forest. <laughs> when you learn to talk in such a way that your company can be enjoyed, people will be more accountable. Learn to joke with each other. Be available for each other. Marriage was intended for companionship. One of the reasons why marriage was instituted was because God saw that it is not good for a man to be alone. It was to deal with the issue of loneliness. So your companionship is important everywhere. Those who are here somehow, that when I say everywhere, it's not just the sitting room and the kitchen, there's somewhere else. I can sit there be available. But also, intellectually, and here actually I take the anatomy of the human being. And I say, the mind controls everything else. You know, 
it is not what we said earlier, one advancing at the expense of the other person. It is both of you developing so that intellectually and emotionally, that is the soul, there is well-being and you create an atmosphere of peace and joy. That there is a tranquil and serene uh, lifestyle that you are having so that even as you age, you age gracefully. Very, very important. One of the problems, the greatest problem right now in the world is that of emotional uh, well-being or mental health. But it is coming because people are not present for each other. Be present, and when you are there, it is not to be on the mobile phone, because that's the other problem. It is to be there in reality, what we call quality time. Then, take care of your mouth. What kind of talk do you use? Are you cynical? Are you sarcastic? Are you demeaning? You know? Or are you encouraging and uplifting? What do you say? When you are given chapatis, don't say, na easy, come on, this kid's easy. <laughs> say, you can say it differently, even if they see it. See it. <laughs> you can say, hey, this is chapati, you suit it. Lakini, I think if you reduce the fire, it will help. It will help. You are still communicating with your heart. See, Dio. <laughs> we used to joke that some people tell their spouses, Sasa, what do you make for me? Women in there are bad talking. But you can say this, you know, you can still make the point, not in a sarcastic manner. You can say, hey, Mama, I don't know. Why don't we keep here in the Kazao? <laughs> and you know you are giving excuse for her. She she will be gracious and next time she will be there so that the food is not bad. Or something like that. How you are speaking, how you speak to your spouse matters. People don't look forward to joining your company just because of the way. And you know that even in places where we work, but ignore so in marriage. You know, people may be sarcastic and cynical at the place of work. He can bear that. But when it is your spouse, why? That's when he comes and you decide he need to go and sleep. And it is very young. So watch what you say to each other. We are talking about your physical presence. Watch your eyes. What is it that you watch? These days, many people have been overtaken by uh, pornography. You know, when you're a pastor, you get to hear things and to, yeah, to hear things. Um, one couple that I was cursed, they were leaders, they were respected. Uh, yes, in the city of church, but the man had allowed himself to be overtaken by pornography. And that pornography had led him to become unfaithful to his wife. <coughs> And uh, by the time they were coming to us, the wife was coming to say, Pastor, I am leaving this man. You know, and it was tough. It was tough. And it all started by him meditating. Because with the phone, you can see. But it is you will be accountable, even to yourself, and decide, I am not going to do this. By God's grace, and after long, long counseling sessions, how many counseling? Well, not too many, but long counseling sessions. The marriage was there. The man turned and uh, he confessed and agreed. And what is it that you are allowed to be said? Maybe I don't have to emphasize or talk about this. Seeing and listening is important. What is it that you allow your hands to do? What are you working at? Are you using your hands like Nehemiah, saying, I, I will lay hands on my spouse? And it's not this kind of lay. It's this kind of lay. And this kind of lay. You know, you should not use your, your hands to beat your spouse. 
and not I am saying spouse, because these days the beating is not just by the men. Where do your feet go? What company do you keep? So if you look at yourself from the head, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, you know, it is important. What do you do with your total body? Do you take care of yourself physically now? I'm talking about your health. Do you observe hygiene? Do you take showers? Because they are going to take long, especially those who are caught by laws. And it, became, it becomes difficult. What are you in the MMA? And what is available in this country? Do you brush your teeth? Do you dress decent? And the key word there is decent. Do you feed appropriately? Is your food balanced diet? Or you overindulge? Do you neglect nourishment of your body? And this body needs to be exercised because we want you to live long enough to take care of your children. Uh, there are times I don't want to go for exercise, but my wife tells me, no, we must go. And she almost reads for me fasting on the chapter 4, verse 8. For physical training is of some value. But ungodly, and, but, and God, but godliness has value for all things. But if the part she emphasizes is that one, only exercise has some value. And it is true. We need to exercise, we need to eat well. And I think these things are important. It's important to visit the doctor once in a while uh, for examination. We don't want you to go before your time because your presence is critical to the people that you are brought into the world, the children. And even your spouse, they marry you because they want to live with you for the longest. I know we say that you them to a spouse, but we are not saying that death should come soon. Amen? Amen. And then financially, uh, financially, we need to be accountable for our time because time is valid. Be accountable for how you use your time. Ensure there is money to be accounted for or to be accountable for. So your time should be used in such a way that you are bringing money that will help the family. It is uh, uh, Solomon who wrote and said, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Uh, it's, see here it says man, but I know there's a place it says like a woman. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. The same idea is repeated in Proverbs 24, verse 32 to 34. So, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that the person who misuses his time and doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it actually reads like this. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, <clears throat> and the relative is the starting with your spouse, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith, and I am quoting, and is worse than an unbeliever. You're born again, but the scripture says that you're worse than an unbeliever. If you're not providing for your family. And I am saying, providing for your family starts by you being accountable for your time. I know we are living in a day when many people have lost jobs. But brothers and sisters, when you have lost a job, there is something you can do. Take pride, put it in the back pocket, or even throw it away, and do what you must do to ensure that you can eat. Surely, I look at all of you that are seated here, and I see your people that are educated, and education can be a problem. When you have education, you don't have the job that you want, but there is something you can do. I am sure there is something you can do to put money in your pocket. 
even if it means walking. I have said I am a senior pastor. I've been a senior pastor, now I'm a, a bishop, but I will say this with all sincerity. If it comes to that, I will do it. I, in any case, people live here. You know, we are only proud when we are here. People live here, they have PhDs or they have degrees. They go to America, they are told we don't know this degree. And those people go to wash dishes, go to wash old people, go to watch over old people, and they come back with dollars, and we think the dollars were collected on the streets. If they can do that there, I believe if the Kenyans can be helped to do what they can do here, we can lift our economy. And more than that, we will not be told to be master. Be accountable for your time, for your strength, for your energy, for your intellectual capacities. Surely there is something we can do. And that's why sometimes when I'm moving in Nairobi, I see some people, they are strong, they are healthy, and they are poor begging. And I have, I have spoken to a few, and I have told them, no, you are strong, you look healthy. You can do something. Of course, because we have given them a few points here and there, it's like we have fed them, you know, a poison, or it's like we have cast them to, to, to just zrula and think they should get something. I know there are people who are deserving, but you cannot be perpetually be a beggar, continually be helped. I have been helped. I'm sure there are many people who have been helped. I am an advocate for helping people who are going in a season of trouble, but it can't be on a continuous basis. And I know even in church, because I have worked there, there are people who have come to church. I've helped them once, twice, and they come at that time and I tell them, I will not give you. Yes, we could, but we will not give you. We are not teaching you good manners. We are making you dependent. Sasa ni mateta siku kubiri. Like what I am saying, let's use our money well. Okay, marriage includes our manners. When the Bible says that the two shall be one, I believe that our money should come together. And I go here, I will step on toes uh, because of where we are coming from. We talked about one thing and what we have been taught. Mine is this, when the pastor says, you know, will you take this to be your wife, lovely your wedding wife, and you say yes, or even if you have not said that, but you are married, it means you became together. So her money, his money belongs to us, to, and we should be accountable for that money. It is not his and us, it is our money. And I will say this, when the money comes together, you achieve more. When you do your own, it is like what the Bible says. One person will chase away a thousand, two people will chase away not two thousand, but ten thousand. There is an exponential, there is an exponential growth when we bring our resources together. And I'm saying, if you're going to be accountable for money, it is to also agree to bring these monies together. God has taken us through very interesting seasons. When we got married, my wife had just been employed for two weeks. So we went to honeymoon. She, she was told she it's unpaid. So she was just entering, entering what? And the, the job market. Employed. Years later, I am in ministry. She is in in the, in the job market, and she she is rising and rising, but I was still the head, by the way. And I have I have to learn it's still our money. Then she retired, not retired, she resigned, but so that she did have a son. I am the one who is still being paid as a pastor. So we eat our, my money. But it is not my money, it's our money. 
And she is here, you can confirm with her secretly. She is a signatory of all the accounts you have. And it is not that she will have to, to, uh, to she can sign. I actually don't keep the checkbooks. And she can withdraw it because we have agreed. And I'm saying it can be done. But having said that, I want to still emphasize that happens because there is trust. That happens because we have talked and agreed. And I have come to a place where we agree there will be no misuse of money. Because for that to be opened to you, you need to prove yourself to be a person of integrity and a person that can be trusted by your spouse. And I know that there are people that can do that because as soon as that is opened, the person will go to Dubai. <laughs> Do you know you wear a suit, a nice one like this? You are told, oh, that's a nice suit. If you come with it the next Sunday, why do I give you? These are liabilities. You wear it, it, it loses its. The value keeps on depreciating. Ladies, are you listening? If you have enough, just to shake up. And even men, cars are liabilities. I love the ladies who say men. Because when a car, when a man's car is in, you know, has broken down, you would think somebody is sick or is dying. These days, they don't have an amuna wasiri. So, wasiri with wasiri. Okay? Yes, and I mean, see, see, that's what I have said. Even if it is that, and don't worry, God has a few You will still have a right here. Who knows what you came with? He has seated here. The people who came with Vasili and the people that came with the Vasili's friends, to make it up. God has a few What I am saying, be, be. I was going to use the word frugal. Yes, frugal, but not necessarily that. But just be realistic and live within what God has given you, within your means, and enjoy your life. As a new person, watch any man is Cooperate with one another in all things that God has given you, the provisions that God has given you. Transparency in your income and expenditure, agreement on what is it, especially the big things that you're doing. Uh, you know, there are many stories to tell these people. Okay. Yes, let me tell them. Man. This business of having a project, a mega project, and your wife does not know. And you don't know which file will be opened first. Do you know there are many men who have gone and their projects that they have done are not known by anybody in the family. Many of them are taken by other people. Many monies. Have you, have you heard of this government institution that keeps money that they don't know who it belongs to? It is in billions. It is because there was a place there was no accountability and we say transparency. Where somebody was keeping money or investing in something and he didn't tell anybody. Especially shares. People bought shares, they earn money, they are paying dividends, they don't know where to go. The insurance or the, the, the companies that the shares are, you know, compelled to pass that money to the government and it is into billions. At that time, maybe the children are not going to school, and there are millions that are owned by those people. May God deliver us. Deliver us from that spirit we started with, of saying, my culture. I was told. And I, and I know this because I know when I got married, on the day I got married, an old person came to me at the evening, when the wedding was over. 
I didn't think that I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. He thought he's giving me a lot of wisdom. No, that there are some things you never tell your wife you're doing. Make sure that that happens. In other words, he was not, he was telling me I should have programs and projects and things that I don't allow my wife to know about. If I have a plot, my wife knows about it. Because it's not my it is a plot. And I want to encourage you, please walk together with your spouse. Because be accountable because you don't know your children are going to care. I know we may not be where we want to be or even what we have said, but uh, let me just say that lack of financial accountability will slow you down and it will make you not achieve as much as you would have, but uh, we can gradually change from here. We can learn to hold each other in trust and confidentiality. And as we become more and more transparent, God will bless us, God will increase us, and God will lead us to where he wants us to go. May the Lord bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I would speak for 30 minutes. I have exceeded. And I see my spouse wants to add. <laughs> Just one word on the issue you talked about plots. It's one thing to tell your spouse, we have this plot. But why is go and see where the plot is? Because it's possible for the plot to be there, but when the man is not there, you have no idea how to get to that point. So take the next step. That's accountability. God bless you. Okay. I'm going to ask Brain and the questions will come. Father, in the name of Jesus. You are the one who started this institution of marriage and you blessed it. And you are the one that the Lord can sustain it and carry it forward. We are not in any way passing the back to you. We know that it takes the two of us plus you to succeed. Our prayer, dear Lord, is that the Holy Spirit will use the words we have shared tonight to impact on every man, every woman that is gathered today. I pray that you help us, dear Lord, to be all that is negative. Dear Lord, to be united to our spouses, to live together around you, so that in the end, we will be happy and that, Lord, we will honor you and glorify you. I know that, Heavenly Father, that marriage sometimes becomes the teacher of character because of the things that we experience there. But may it be that it is teaching us while you are walking with us, while you are leading us and guiding us. I pray for every person that is at the hearing of my voice, that, Lord, there will be a word, a statement that will linger and help them to become better students of the resource that you have put in their hands, the resource that comes through their spouse, and the resource that they are, so that in the end the church will become the uh, will become the place to look to and will influence the society. We pray that Lord, society is not the one that is going to influence the church, but the church to your Lord will shed light for the people uh, uh, that are in the world. Thank you very much. We bless you and we honor you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.